Now, actualism also frees us from the future. That's what T.S. Eliot was saying, liberation from the future. It gives a totally different meaning to hope, anticipation, worry, and what if. So we don't have to worry so much about all these things that might happen. Now, there, there's been a study that said about 30% of what we worry about involve things that we can't control and we have you know, no influence over. But we worry about them anyway. You know, is it going to rain tomorrow? I mean, that's not something that most of us worry about. But we sort of worry, well, should I go to that college or should I go to this college? Or should I call her up? You know, should I ask her out or should I not ask her out? Or should I ask him out or should I not ask him out? Um, we worry about all these little things. Now, it's all right to worry, but if you realize that the future is already predetermined, that worry takes on a different meaning. Now, I think most of us look at the past and regret um, about things that we did do or did not do more so than we think about the future, because we think the future is unlimited. Um, and by the way, thinking about the future, having no free will does not mean that you are like in a straitjacket, that you walk around having no say whatsoever in the matter, because we all make decisions and we all act upon them. In fact, I would claim that you have never had any free will in your entire life. But does that mean that you feel constrained or restricted? No. But let's move on to regret. We talked about that. There's a fellow named Hamilton Beasley. He has a 10-step program for dealing with regret. Spiritual and psychological tools, creative visualization, journaling, affirmation, thought analysis, meditation, sharing with others. Hey, I screwed up. You know, did you screw up too? I hope so, because now I can feel better. Insights into toxic thought patterns. You know that schadenfreude where you, where you sort of take pleasure in somebody else's misery? Persistent myths about forgiveness. Anyway, he has a 10-step program. Now, I don't like to count that high. I want to come up with a one-step program. You could not have done otherwise. All of Beasley's 10 steps are ultimately only cosmetic, because you're still wondering, oh, OK, I can do all the affirmations I want. I can do all the meditation, sharing with others, get rid of toxic thoughts. But I still wonder, why the hell didn't I do otherwise? Why was I so friggin' whatever? OK? That's still out there in Beasley's world. Let me end with a uh, discussion of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And you've probably all heard this. In ancient Greece, in fact, I mean, they have located where the priestesses of Apollo uh, said their, or, or gave their oracles. There's a place. Uh, where gases come out, and they think, scientists think, and anthropologists and, and archaeologists think that th these gases may have induced hallucinations in these priestesses. But anyway, the most famous oracle or dictum at Delphi was know thyself. Uh, and here we've got a, an urn with the Delphic Pythia attended by a supplicant. You know, and people went to the oracle to say what's going to happen, or you know, is it going to rain, or should I marry somebody, or how do I make more money, um, how do I get better grades? Um, the Greeks went there, asked the oracle something, and the oracle gave him an answer. And the most famous answer is know thyself. This is Einstein's final view on quantum theory. It's like a Bronx cheer. And that's the... Uh, cover of the book that I just put out, and my email is nodice at goddoesnotplaydice.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>